Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHope2018.com. As a follow-up to my last video regarding the biblical facts confirming the identity of Mystery Babylon being Mecca, and the biblical facts surrounding Iran's destruction of that Islamic holy site in Mecca, and the suggestion that Turkey would most likely retaliate against Iran, given the fact that Turkey really wants to be the dominant influence in the Middle East as it regards Islam, and Turkey being the biblically confirmed region out of which the Antichrist arises, a viewer sent me the following article published days ago confirming Erdogan's desire to construct an Islamic army that will attack and destroy Israel on all sides. Turkey has the second largest army on the planet next to the United States. That's a scenario which I believe makes per perfect sense if, for whatever reason, the U.S. is no longer able to defend Saudi Arabia in the near future, where Turkey steps up to fill that void. Just to quickly go over uh, a few facts, the spiritual new year, 5778, began March 18, we're now in 5778, that's 77 days into the new year, 2018. Now, whether or not that 77 days means something, I really can't tell you, but I just know, I'm just giving you the facts, 77 days into the new year, 2018. Holocaust Remembrance Day lies just ahead for Israel on the Hebrew calendar. That date is April 11. 200 days past the Revelation 12 sign, 10 days after Passover, and 40 days to Pentecost, and 33 days before Israel turned 70. Now, due to an error in calculations within my last video that caused us to have to take that video down, I need to set the record straight on the following facts. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Genesis 7:11. So uh, we know from Genesis 7:11 that it was on this 17th day of the second month um, that 600 years after creation when Adam was 600, Pentecost is the same day as it is this year. Pentecost is also marked on the Hebrew calendar, I found that interesting. Now, as I've said before, our research shows that creation day one, May 5th, 3983 BCE. This is by counting the ages of the patriarchs. Now, forward 6,000 years, the date is May 5, 2018. So 3983 plus 2018 equals 6,000. And we do not count the year zero. Now, the ninth day of the month of Av, mid-August, is a great day of sorrow to Israel. Uh, Tisha B'Av. On this day, it was on that day in 588 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple. The second temple was laid waste by the Romans under Titus on the same day in 70 A.D. And on this day in 135 A.D., at the conclusion of a three-and-a-half-year messianic revolt, the Romans crushed that revolt. Now, if anything significant occurs on Tishbiav this year, the date will be July 22. That's 63 days after Pentecost. So we're just passing along these facts. We're giving you facts, numbers, where that you can make up your own mind, draw your own conclusions as to where we are, and what might occur. Now we know 1948 is well known to have prophetic significance. We know that Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948. The time between the day that Jesus was crucified, which was April 2, 33 AD, and the destruction of the temple, which Jesus prophesied would occur in 70 AD, was precisely 1948 weeks and there was a partial lunar eclipse on that day, the day that Jesus was crucified. 
Our Lord also raised from the dead on April 4, 33, the first day of the week. The reason we know it was April 4 is because it had to be the first day of the week. This is when the women ran to the tomb, according to Scripture. The Jews always counted days inclusively. It was 40 days to May 14, the day that Jesus ascended. And as I've pointed out many times in the past, this was a discovery we made last year. Our Lord Jesus Christ ascended the exact same day as Israel was reborn in 1948, which was May 14. Now there are exactly 200 months between 9-11, September 11, 2001, the, the day that the world changed forever, and Aliyah of Messiah, May 12, 2018, which has to do with Israel's law of return. For generations, Aliyah was associated with the coming of the Jewish Messiah. Jews prayed for their Messiah to come, who was to redeem the land of Israel from Gentile rule. Now, according to the ages of the patriarchs in Genesis, Noah was born 1056 years after Adam, who was created year 1, 3983 BCE, according to our calculations. 3983 forward 1056 years equals 2927, the birth year of Noah. Now, we know that Noah was 600 when the flood occurred, 1656 years after creation. 2927 forward 600 years equals 2327. The numbers drop down because we're, we're looking at B.C., 2327 BCE, 3983 minus 1656 equals 2327. So the flood occurred in the year 2327 BCE. The date of the flood, the, the rains began to fall month to day 17 in the year 2327. And that day on the Gregorian calendar, is May 16 or May 17. That would be four to five days before Pentecost this year. In other words, the fifth day of the 40 days of rain, after it had rained five days, that's the date of Pentecost 2018, which is May 20, 21, according to the Hebrew calendar. Now we believe this to be true based upon the following calculations. Adam was created in the year 3983. You factor in Adam's age of 930 years, and we see that Adam died in 3053. We know Noah was born 126 years after Adam died. 3053 minus 126 equals 2927. So the flood occurred in Noah's 600th year in the year 2327. Adam's death, the year of his death, 3053, minus the year of the flood, 2327, equals 726. So the flood occurred 726 years after Adam died. In other words, the years between Adam's death and the flood were 726 years. Now, I find it interesting that Strong's Greek, number 726, this is something that we learned last year, is harpazo, to seize, carry off by force, to claim for oneself eagerly, to snatch out or to snatch away. I find that interesting because 726, rapture, stands in between the first Adam and judgment. If we look at the flood as a type of, of the tribulation judgment. We were taken out of Adam, the earthly, the natural man, Adam who went to dust, went back, returned to dust, and we were placed in Christ spiritually. The second Adam, Christ the second Adam, where there is now no judgment for the believer in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 states, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, I've addressed this question many times, but it needs to be stressed again. The parable of the ten virgins is a parabolic picture of those in the tribulation, post-rapture, who are invited to the kingdom, the kingdom, which is the wedding banquet. The marriage has already, already occurred in heaven. This banquet or wedding supper is where Jesus introduces his bride, the church, to his friends, Israel, during the millennium. The supper or the banquet lasts a thousand years. It represents the millennium. Those who accept the wise enter into the kingdom as sheep. Those who do not, the unwise, do not enter in. Goats. The common misinterpretation has arisen as a deception to lead Christians into believing that God accepts us based upon a system of merit, which is simply not the case. Now, I found this following fact interesting. I thought I'd pass this along. 5778 divided by 2 equals 2889. If, if we look at Strong's Hebrew number 2889, the word is pure. If we look at Strong's Greek number 2889, we see the world is the word is cosmos, world. So in the two halves of five seven seven eight, we get from Strong's Greek and Hebrew the two words pure world. I looked up the five seven seven eight verse. It's Deuteronomy thirty two nineteen. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. He's talking about the worshiping of idols. And we know that false idol worship, it's always been a part of human history, but it will permeate the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. So I find that interesting. I took a closer look at the Song of Solomon again, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, which I believe suggests a spring departure. Now, if you look at Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 10 through 13, My beloved testified and said unto me, Rise up, my darling companion, my beautiful, and depart. For lo, the winner is alienate. Now, I'm, I'm reading from the original text here. The rain is changed, the flowers see on the earth, the time of the songs touches, and the voice of turtle doves is heard in our land. The fig tree makes spicy her green figs, and the vines with blossom give a savor. Arise, my love, my beautiful, and depart. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one. Now I'm reading from the authorized version here. And come away, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle dove, which represents Christ, is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, 
and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The dove was often offered as a sacrifice in ancient times and was a type of our innocent Savior to show how that he would afterwards be put to death for the guilty. Our Savior speaks of the innocence of this bird when he says to his disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This, this bird has a very sweet but mournful voice. Many of you have written to me Tell me about the, the, the doves that you see that come into your backyard. And we've got doves around our place, and they're, they're most often seen in pairs. And it's a well-known fact that they will mourn after a lost mate. Jesus, no doubt, mourns as it regards those of his who were lost. We know he wept over Lazarus, who had died. I believe he also mourns the physical separation of himself from his soon-to-be bride, the church. Therefore, let's consider the following facts. The harmless dove is a picture of Christ. Mourning doves do mate for life, but will seek out another if that one is dead. The bond is so strong, it extends beyond death. And these doves have been known to watch over, actually watch over and care for their deceased mates. And they have been known to return to the place where the birds died. The turtle dove or rain dove is a bird of passage. It appears in Judea early in the spring when the leaves are coming out. It flies away to a warmer climate. Uh, put rapture in parentheses there. To spend the winter, tribulation, and returns in spring, second coming. Because of the number of days involved on any timeline, and I've emphasized this a number of times, 25, 50 days according to Revelation and Daniel. A spring rapture means a spring return. Both the rapture and the second coming must occur in the same season. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I flee away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. So Psalm 55, to me, suggests a pre-trib rapture as well as a spring rapture. Now concerning the last trump, mentioned by the Apostle Paul, I do not believe this trumpet blast is associated with Israel as it concerns the rapture of the church, because it is not blown by man, but God. And his blowing the trumpet only occurs twice, only twice in all of Scripture, Mount Sinai and the rapture. And Jews celebrate the giving of the Torah on Pentecost. I believe the phrase, last trump, by Paul signifies or represents the end of the church age. And Paul, when he wrote that phrase, he knew that God blew the trumpet, trumpet only once before, and that was on Pentecost at Mount Sinai. So this reinforces my belief in a spring rapture. I see this as God revealing to us the season of the, of the return. Now, will Jesus return this spring? I do not know. If, if he does not, our research continues. And we're not going to give up. We're not going to quit. Many of you know that I've become accustomed to talking about our life in Christ in these prophetic videos. So I feel compelled to include the following. This is John chapter 12, 23 and 24. But Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless... A kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It remains only a seed, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, many, many people don't realize that a seed is a, is a living thing. It's not dead. It's not something that you put into the ground dead, and then it all, all of a sudden comes alive. When you place a living seed in the dark, damp, cold earth, it dies. 
and what it brings forth is fruit of its own kind, of its own kind, not, a, not another kind. Your beloved Savior was that seed that produced the life in, in you that you now enjoy. So the message of the gospel of grace is actually seen in nature itself. It's a living testimony to the message of the cross. And you will never be rooted up, Matthew 15, 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. But the lesson, folks, doesn't end there. We ourselves are not above our Master in the sense of this parabolic picture of his death which brought forth life in us. The Apostle Paul declares that death works in us, but life in you. Our death to self brings forth the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians 4, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now that is a very profound statement, folks. Though our, our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I don't know how many questions I've gotten or emails I've received from viewers who, who have said, Steve, I just don't understand what's going on in my life because I can't stop sinning. When Paul says, the Word of God says, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man, the new creation in Christ, is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't focus on our sin or ourselves or our circumstances, but on our Savior. Now, as a final note, I want to say this to all of those who have followed this ministry. None of us knows for sure when the Lord will come. All, all we have ever been able to do is present to one another what we believe is the most likely time frame based upon the evidence. This ministry has done that and it will continue to do that until we are taken out of here. And we are instructed to encourage one another as we see the day approaching. I believe this ministry is doing just that. And as long as we are here, there is much to be said about our lives in Him. So much to be said that many of us just don't hear anymore. We don't hear anywhere else nowadays. Things that I want to remind you all of. We have access to God's grace. We're adopted by God. We get an inheritance. We are elected. We are His elect. We become a child of God by the mercy and the grace of God. We get a heavenly citizenship. That, that's our home. We become a servant. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We become a new creature. All old things have passed away. We become priests, priests of God. We are reconciled to God. We're sanctified. We're accepted in the Beloved, baptized into the body of Christ. We've been crucified with Him. We've been buried with Him. We've been raised with Him. In fact, folks, we've been, we have ascended with Him, and we are co-seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We put on Christ. We have eternal life. Eternal life will never perish. We have peace with God. God has nothing against you, folks. We became a friend of God. We are members of His family and of His household. We get in the Lamb's Book of Life. We receive His righteousness. We don't even walk in our own righteousness. We walk in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our names are written in heaven. He's actually engraved our names on the palms of His hand. Folks, He bottles your tears. 
He knows the paths that you take. And when he has tested us, he says, we shall come forth as gold. He's promised to complete the work that he began in us. We are given a blessed hope of his returning. We are seated in heavenly places. We have fellowship with the Trinity. We are born again with a spiritual rebirth. We've received an anointing. The Holy Spirit will live with us now and forever. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. We're for, forgiven all of our trespasses, all of them, according to Colossians. We become his ambassadors in this sin-sick world, this lost, dying world. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Our need, our every single need will be supplied by God. We're given an inner strength to accomplish all things. The Lord becomes our helper instead of our judge. We get abounding grace. We get eternal love. Everything that happens to us will be for our, for our ultimate good. He doesn't allow anything to touch your life except it be for your ultimate good. He's faithful even when we're not. We are made kings. We became saints. He calls us saints. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. We will stand before him. We do stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I really do appreciate your prayers. And I pray for all of you constantly. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.